But now I'm going to make it more realistic. And if you remember my lecture from chapter 8, which was confidence intervals, or if you saw the videos, if you weren't here for the lecture, um, I pointed out there's something inherently unrealistic about this whole problem that we have to address. And we know how to address it because we did it once before. But let's remind the class of what that is. Kelvin, since you're the expert on this, what's, what's the problem with this? Uh, what, was it the, the number? What? Five? Sample? No, sample size is just sound. It is a small sample. What was the question? What was the question? What was the question? This method involves going to the Z table. Oh. oh, oh. <laughs> going to the T table. But why would you want to go to the T table? Yes. Because this is a example assumes a sigma, which stands for the standard deviation among all the thousands of numbers in the population is a known number. How do you know? Well, it's better assigned we can know it because it's on a regular pattern. But among most real life examples, the numbers aren't that perfectly, you know, straight line. You don't know it, in which case, what do you do? Well, we did this back, this back to Marcus. And okay. Um, what we did in the chapter eight is we substituted, instead of the sigma, we substituted the next best thing, which was the standard deviation of the sample. The sample is not the whole population, but it's better than nothing. And when you do that, you introduce more uncertainty into the whole process, because this number here is not a perfect representation of the sigma, and therefore, to automatically take into account that amount of spread, we go to the T table, which is the same as the Z table, a little more spread out. But we take it one step beyond that. It's spread out according to the sample size. If the sample size is 5,000, then the S and the sigma are practically identical. If the sample size is 500, probably the S and the sigma are probably identical, almost identical. When the sample size is 5, then you may get a big discrepancy between the S and the sigma. So you really got to give yourself a lot of extra leeway to still be right 95% of the time or wrong 5% of the time. So after all is said and done, the shortcut we're going to be using the rest of the term can be outlined in the following, hopefully, neater steps. You write out the hypothesis. That you can't, you can't get around. You've got to write out the hypothesis. Now, some of you remember from the last term, we're going to have some examples less than and greater than. We'll come to that probably either later today or next time. In fact, now I, have, now I have a sense of when the test is going to be. But anyway, we'll, we'll, do the, we'll, do the, we'll do the hypotheses. Step number two, you plug your number into this formula, x minus mu over s over the square root of n. At this point, not just something you just memorize, but something you really understand. The third step is you make your boundaries, not in terms of the trial and error, but go straight to the t table, which has the basic shape and the middle value of zero. But there's not a standard deviation of one. That's not going to be here. It's going to be some other number bigger than one, but not one, because it's more stretched out than the z-table. This is do not reject region. This is the reject region, meaning anything past that boundary. And that boundary is based on the alpha divided by two. The other half of the alpha is the other alpha divided by two. The two of them together make up alpha. This is also labeled reject a zero. And all you got to do is, once you do your calculation, is you Make an arrow, I mean, you gotta look at you gotta do basically two things. You gotta figure out the hypotheses, which is very easy or sometimes a little challenging. You gotta plug numbers into a formula, which is the easiest part of this whole process. You gotta look, know how to look up a t table with degrees of freedom, of course, I should put that down as well, degree of, degrees of freedom of n minus one. And then once you look it up, you make a simple comparison and you got yourself you got yourself the problem right in you know literally a couple of minutes. <laughs>